Ahead to programs for tomorrow evening on BBC One. At 7.15, the fate of King's Royal is to be decided in the final episode. The charge now is one of fraud. You will be prosecuted by the Crown. Perhaps prison might be the proper place to watch the demise of King's Royal. At five past eight, the Sunday film is The Friends of Eddie Coyle, a tense thriller of the Boston underworld. You're going to your bank. You and I my friend. My other friend will stay here with your wife and children to make sure nothing happens to them. And at 9.40, Omnibus. 30 years ago, Claire Bloom was a very young, rather unknown actress. Then Charlie Chaplin came along and cast her as his co-star in Limelight. And after that, her life was never quite the same. Stardom came into it, and so did people like Olivier and Gielgud and Burton and Steiger. Well, now Claire Bloom has written her autobiography, Limelight and After. And I'll be discussing that with her on Omnibus. Just a taste of Sunday evening entertainment on BBC One. Tonight, the guests of Michael Parkinson at 11.15 are Jimmy Savile, OBE, Michael Palin, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Marty Webb and Donald Sindon. Before that, in a quarter of an hour, match of the day shows highlights from today's games between Arsenal and Ipswich Town and Oldham versus Sheffield Wednesday. On BBC One Now, the news with Jan Leeming. The former Labour minister, Roy Mason, has fought off a left-wing attempt to unseat him in his constituency. Liverpool win the Wembley final and end up with two cups, though it takes them extra time. And the Essex man, who won a fortune in Reno, comes home and says he'd like to try again. The former Labour government minister, Roy Mason, has fought off a left-wing attempt to replace him at Barnsley, the constituency he's represented in Parliament for 29 years. He's been re-selected as Labour candidate for the next general election. Mike Smart reports. Whilst Roy Mason secured 47 branch nominations, his opponent, left-winger Jack Brown, received only four. But with miners' delegates unusually allowed a free vote, a close result was possible. As the delegates decided, the two men chatted, and only the scrutineers know just how close it actually was. The voting figures were not disclosed. Because boundary changes will make another selection meeting almost certain before the next general election, there were suggestions that the left in the party hadn't tried very hard today. I don't think that's strictly true. I think what's happened is a lot of people have probably stayed away because they thought it was a cut and dried decision for Roy Mason, and therefore there hasn't been a very well attended conference. So what did you think? Do you think it was cut and dry before you came? No, I don't. I never take that attitude whatsoever. I'm always prepared to face the obstacles as they come, and sometimes you never know what lies beyond the other side of the wall, and that could have been possible today. The Labour Party's left wing has had more success in Scotland. Candidates on a list put forward by the Labour Coordinating Committee, which supports the views of Mr Tony Benn, were among newly elected members of the Scottish Labour Party's executive. A national opinion poll to appear in tomorrow's Observer puts Labour in the lead to win the Glasgow Hillhead by-election with the support of 33% of the electors. The poll puts the Conservatives second and the SDP in third place, 10 points behind Labour. Liverpool have retained the Football League Cup and become the first winners of the new Milk Trophy. In a thrilling game that went into extra time at Wembley, they beat Spurs 3-1 after the London club had held the lead for most of the games. Our sports correspondent, Michael Blakey, was among the 100,000 people who saw them do it. Spurs have never lost at Wembley, and the way they played for most of the first 90 minutes, it didn't look as though they'd lose that impressive record today. Hoddle found Archibald, who shook off Lawrenson to beat Grobelar, and the game was only 11 minutes old. 
1-0 to Spurs, a lead they were to hold on to until the 87th minute. As for Liverpool, well, they created some fine chances, but just couldn't turn them into goals. A beautifully flighted cross from Dalglish gave Lee every chance to score, but the former Liverpool keeper, Clemens, hung on, and at half-time, Spurs still had their slender lead. In the second half, Spurs continued to string together some attractive football, and Hazard was linking well with the strikers. Three minutes to go, and the Liverpool number five, Ronnie Whelan, surged into the attack. Liverpool had looked dead, but over the years, this is when they've been at their most dangerous. Today was no exception, and there was young Whelan, who took his first time chance like an old professional. 1-1, and that was the first goal conceded by Spurs in the whole competition, and suddenly it looked as though Liverpool would win. The second period of extra time, and our dealers of all people made a mistake in defence. It cost Spurs the cup. Dalglish seemed to take ages, but there was Whelan to make it 2-1 on his first Wembley appearance. And still Liverpool hadn't finished. They won the trophy last year and retained it with style this year. This time it was another youngster who scored. Ian Rush made it 3-1 just before the end. And for Liverpool, two trophies. The Milk Cup, the new prize, goes to join all the other silverware at Anfield. The Football League Cup goes back to the league's headquarters where it will stay. As well as the final, it was a reasonably full league programme. And Southampton's manager, Laurie McMenemy, must be a disappointed man tonight. His side were held at home in a goalless draw with West Bromwich Albion. Nevertheless, Southampton stay on top of the first division. Swansea could only manage a goalless draw too in their home game with Coventry. Manchester United didn't have a game. Tommy Caton celebrated his 100th game for Manchester City by scoring the goal that gave them a point at Nottingham Forest. And one happy manager tonight, Ron Saunders, whose new club, Birmingham City, won for the first time since he took over. It was rugby union in the John Player Cup quarter-finals day and Leicester, the holders, for the last three years met their beaten opponents from the 1981 final, Gosford. Nigel Starmer-Smith is the commentator. Joyce, tap back to Wheeler. Youngs, loosely away, Cusworth looks for the attacking chance, dodge, Barmore across from the right wing, now Evans. Evans out on the right flank. Has Barnwell inside, good into play, taken on by Woodward. Woodward still up to the 22. It's going to be a superb try for Smith, one of the greatest of the season. That was Leicester at their brilliant best. The semi-finals will be a mainly Midland affair. Joining Leicester will be Gloucester, Coventry and Moseley. In the quarter-finals of the Rugby League Challenge Cup, Bradford Northern drew 8-all with Widnes. The replays at Widnes on Wednesday. On the second day of the cricket match in Johannesburg between South Africa and the English players, South Africa declared at 400 for 7, and at the close the English 11 had made 90 for 5. Nearly three times as many people as yesterday turned up to watch. The South African players and much of the country's press are treating this game as a test match, but as David Cass reports, there are still those who take a different view. Sanctions busting is the name of this particular game, and although cricket is one of the most integrated sports in South Africa, there are still pressure groups whose attitudes harden with every new tour and with every concession they win. A former president of the South African Council of Sport, Hassan Hawa, leads one such group. The first uh, action was one of dismay, but on second thoughts, uh, one of contempt that uh, people could, uh, who had had so much from cricket could actually damage the establishment in the way they did. They, of course, see it the other way, don't they? They see that they are actually helping South Africa move more into non-racial sport. Um, I wonder if they see just beyond that 80,000 odd runs they're getting for this trip. Um, helping South Africa? If they believe that there are changes in sport in South Africa, then surely they must realize that that sport became because of the isolation of South Africa. And, and, it's, uh, and if they believe that, then, then they are harming any further progress because I think it will stop there. 
At the moment, though, the sanction breakers seem to be winning. At present, there's a representative rugby team, the South American Jaguars in Cape Town, as well as the English cricketers, who've now moved on to Johannesburg. They're due to play two so-called test matches against the rugby Springboks. The Americans have suffered another public relations setback in their efforts to show that Nicaragua is involved in the civil war in El Salvador. The State Department has now handed back to Nicaragua a 19-year-old youth who changed his story about the alleged involvement when he appeared before reporters in Washington. He'd been expected to say the Nicaraguan government had sent him to the rebels. Instead, he said he joined them because he believed in their cause and his earlier story resulted from threats and torture. Uh, they have tried uh, through a uh, uh, type of, of psychological coercion uh, to have me say certain, certain things regarding what is happening in El Salvador. In fact, an official of the U.S. Embassy uh, told me that they needed uh, to demonstrate the presence of Cubans in El Salvador. The, they gave me an option. They said I could come here and, and uh, do what I'm doing or face a certain death. Obviously, he's either lied to his interviewers and the public since his capture, or he lied to the press today. The United States jury trying the Danish aristocrat Klaus von Bülow for the attempted murder of his wealthy wife are still out after three days. They've been given a rerun of key evidence from Maria Schralhammer, who was Mrs. von Bülow's maid, describing how Mr. von Bülow refused to call a doctor when his wife went into a coma. Mr. von Bulow, who's free on bail of $100,000, faces a maximum of 40 years in jail if convicted. The jury of seven men and five women have to decide if he tried to kill his wife by injecting her with insulin in order to inherit a $14 million fortune. Figures published by the police showing the proportion of violent crime committed by black people have been strongly criticized by the British Council of Churches. The council says the figures are making many black people feel they've been branded as criminals and they're likely to be seized upon by those who wish to stir up racial hatred. Nearly a thousand mourners attended the funeral of Lord Butler at Saffron Walden in Essex. Rab Butler had held almost all the top posts in government during his political career and the esteem in which he was held was obvious from the number who attended the funeral service. Mr. Francis Pym, leader of the House of Commons, was among those who filled the parish church for the private ceremony, while outside hundreds of others waited quietly along the route taken by the cortege. In his address to the congregation, Bishop Allison, a close friend of the family, said Lord Butler had been among the most accomplished and influential statesmen of the century. He said it was obvious that Rab had been a man who was dedicated to the service of his fellow men. A group of Times journalists claim today that a majority of those working on the paper welcome Rupert Murdoch's plan to change the editor. They said that under Mr. Harold Evans, stability had been destroyed in editorial departments. They hoped the editor-designate, Charles Douglas Hume, would resist interference from the proprietor and preserve editorial independence. Mr. Douglas Hume said today he hoped the confusion would soon end. He didn't say when he expected to take over as editor. Conservationist groups have been protesting in London against the killing of baby seals in Canada, where the annual cull is now going on in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. A protest there by the Greenpeace movement was temporarily halted after three of their members were arrested. Ian Webster was with the demonstrators in Trafalgar Square. Three baby seals from West London, rather than the Canadian ice floes, symbolise the 186,000 that will die by the end of this season's cull. On Thursday, the European Parliament recommended a total ban on Canadian seal products. But the 700 protesters heard today that Britain is likely to ignore an embargo. Veteran comedian and conservationist Spike Milligan attacked the Canadian government. Now Canada claims to be a civilised, caring country. Yet while the third world is starving, these creeps are dealing in killing not for food, but for the luxury trade. After the rally, the protesters marched to Westminster and then to the Department of Trade. There, they filed past an open coffin, which they filled with more than 2,000 letters of protest. Keith White, the Essex businessman who won £185,000 on a fruit machine in Reno, Nevada, has flown back to Britain. 
asked at London Airport tonight about a gambling and spending spree after his win, he said he still had over £100,000 left. Neil Bennett reports. Mr White hit the jackpot at the MGM casino, playing on a machine dedicated to Spencer Tracy. The odds against landing the big payout are millions to one, and he'd lost heavily the night before. But then the winning line came up, and the moment every gambler dreams of. Well, I got cleaned out last night. I went to American Express and drew a thousand dollars. Came back in, immediately cashed it, and didn't, had made up my mind that I would play the same machine with a limited amount of money, uh, forty dollars. Um, I used twenty dollars to get the jackpot, and uh, the other twenty eventually I threw it in the waste paper bin. I felt I didn't need it. The initial, initial reaction when I won it um, was just unbelievable. Um, I don't say I'm ashamed to say it, but tears came to my eyes and uh, I just felt sick. I couldn't believe it was real, but um, now I find it is, I'm very pleased. Mr White arrived back in London tonight with his wife Liz. He said the money he'd spent in America had gone on taxes, a flutter on the cards and tips to casino staff. He said he'd always been a generous man, and as if to prove it, the porter at Heathrow Airport was rewarded with a fiver for carrying his bags. That's all from me. Good night. Good evening to you. Well, we certainly can't win with the weather, and today's fine spell was never destined to last because the ridge of high pressure that brought it's moving on now, and in its place, yet more frontal systems, an area of low pressure close by, and that's going to bring back wet, windy weather, followed eventually by blustery showers. Let's look at tonight, though, first of all, and at the moment we have the first of that rain showing up in Northern Ireland and western parts of Scotland. The wind's picking up as well. And during the course of the night, this rain will spread to the rest of Scotland, Wales, and most northern and western parts of England. In the southeastern corner of England, though, I think there'll be sufficient breaks in the cloud, at least in the next hour or two, for the temperatures to fall low enough to give a touch of frost. But even there, later on, as the breeze picks up and cloud spreads across, you'll notice the temperature starting to rise. It'll still be dry, though, in the southeastern corner. That is, until the morning, when there'll be some rain coming along. And then most of England and Wales starting off cloudy with outbreaks of rain. But during the course of the day, the rain will ease off and give way to somewhat brighter and drier weather. That is, with the exception of counties uh, bordering the south coast, where most of the day will stay cloudy with further rain from time to time. Over Scotland and Northern Ireland, it looks like a bright and breezy day with a fair number of showers. Those showers often rather on the heavy side, and they'll be wintry at times, giving some snow on the hills. And later on in the day in Northern Ireland, they'll merge into longer spells of rain. In an hour from now, Michael Parkinson will be talking to Jimmy Savile, OBE, Michael Palin, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Marty Webb, and Donald Sinton. That follows BBC One's Match of the Day. Good evening and welcome to a Match of the Day programme which includes action from the top two divisions. Championship challengers Arsenal and Ipswich confront each other at Highbury. We go to Boundary Park Oldham for their game against fellow promotion challengers Sheffield Wednesday and we see the seven goals from Scotland which virtually decides the Premier League Championship. Tonight's headlines, Liverpool retain the League Cup after beating Spurs 3-1 in extra time. Ronnie Whelan is the hero, scoring twice on his Wembley debut, a Spurs lose for the first time in nine visits to the famous old stadium. Buoyant Bob Paisley was cracking jokes like Jimmy Tarbuck after the game. The Liverpool manager said the Milk Cup is another first for the club. The milk was turning sour before we equalised, but the two extra goals put the cream on it. Well, that's not the first nor the last of those milk jokes, I'm afraid, that we're going to hear. But milk or not, we start our action with a match from the second division. Although we've not been unaware of Oldham's prowess in that division, it's our first visit to Boundary Park this season. And quite an occasion too, because their visitors were Sheffield Wednesday, whose away form has been exhilarating. Your commentator was John Motson. 
the spinning town of Oldham last saw first division football in 1923 but they're aiming for promotion this season despite a rocky run of only one win in their last seven games Jimmy Frizzell who celebrates 12 years as manager here this month has taken number five Neil Firm on loan from Leeds this week because Kenny Clements has had a cartilage operation he's also without Darren McDonough who's suspended but better news concerns number eight Paul Heaton who joins up tomorrow with the England under 21 party for the match in Poland on Wednesday Sheffield Wednesday have won eight away matches this season they're unchanged Mark Smith has been playing in midfield lately and the top scorer is number nine Gary Bannister with 16 goals Sheffield Wednesday manager Jack Charlton with the natty cap left the field in tears here last year Jack Charlton when he went to appeal to the crowd after an invasion of the pitch and the game was held up for half an hour Oldham in the blue shirts and white shorts playing down an appreciable slope from left to right Sheffield Wednesday wearing yellow shirts today 